Good evening. Because of his wide-ranging interests, prolific writing habits, and skill at presenting his views to both academic and popular audiences, Amitai Etzioni was once labeled a one-man profession by a writer for Time Magazine. That appellation was given more than 20 years ago, and he has yet to temper that frantic pace or limit his scope of inquiry and analysis. Amitai Etzioni was born in pre-war Germany, and his memories of youth inc excuse me, include, quote, being beaten up on the way home from kindergarten by a group of boys who found out I was Jewish. His family fled Germany in 1936 and settled in Palestine. At an age when contemporary Gustavus students are busy earning their degree, Dr. Etzioni was a fighter in Israel's War of Independence, an experience which would become the basis for his first book, Diary of a Commando Soldier, published in 1952. After emigrating to the United States, he earned his doctorate in sociology from Berkeley in 1958, just 18 months after beginning the program. He is the author or editor of 19 books, including Winning Without War, The Hard Way to Peace, The Spirit of Community, Modern Organizations, War and Its Prevention, The Limits of Privacy, and The New Golden Rule, Community and Morality, in a democratic society. I learned just two weeks ago that Princeton University Press will be publishing his 20th book, The Monochrome Society, in May 2001. Among his numerous appointments, Dr. Etzioni was professor of sociology at Columbia University for 20 years, an advisor to the White House, a visiting scholar at the Brookings Institution, a Ford Foundation professor at Harvard Business School, and in 1980, he was named the first university professor at George Washington University, a position which he currently holds. The communitarian movement, of which Amitai Etzioni is the founding father, and some would say its driving force, holds that a good society seeks a carefully crafted balance between individual rights and social responsibilities, between liberty and the common good. In the moral dimension, Dr. Etzioni writes, the neoclassical paradigm is too simple. It does not include a pivotal distinction between the sense of pleasure derived from consumption of goods and services and the sense of affirmation attained when a person abides by his or her moral commitments. What are, excuse me, what are our individual and collective moral commitments in a supposed international community if, indeed, the pleasures of consumption serve as the fuel of globalization. How might we create, to borrow from the title of one of his books, a moral dimension which moves us toward a new economics? Dr. Etzioni has graciously agreed to take questions following his presentation this evening. Members of the Gustavus community, members of international society, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Amitai Etzioni. Uh, Dr. Leitz, thank you very much for a very, a very generous introduction and for a very educational ride from the airport. So I'm ahead in political theory by uh, quite, quite a bit. Um, I, Delighted to be back here a uh, second time and to uh, learn that uh, after some uh, fairly bad buffeting by nature, you did this fabulous rebuilding. And it's really a joy to see uh, your uh, new and improved uh, campus. But one thing I was told about that disaster impressed me more than any new building I've seen. And that is that you had classes up and running within a very short period of time after the hurricane hit. We too often don't realize the signals we are sending. When we close schools at the first snowflake, not here, but in my part of the country. <laughs> uh, when uh, any strike of janitors or any other difficulties uh, 
uh, lets us to cancel classes. I, I think it's important to do what you're doing is to show, not just talk about the fact that we're taking education uh, very seriously. I tip my hat to you on that. Now, uh, when you do what I need to do tonight, uh, share a presentation, share some ideas, uh, you, uh, many of you do that, you kind of face a choice, basically. Either you're going to talk about something which you have often talked about before. You may be slightly bored, but at least, you know, uh, it's well prepared and reasonably polished, and you know where it's going. Or, which, which I'm going to do tonight, try your hand at a new topic, and you'll hear me uh, hesitating, halting, getting stuck, uh, because um, I believe the question of globalism, the way I'm going to approach it, is at least for me uh, a new uh, topic. And there is one last reason you'll hear me uh, uh, halting and hesitating. There's some very, very eminent, worldwide recognized economists right in front of me, and they scared the daylight out of me. <laughs> now, with these introductions out of the way, I'm going to put before you a very simple, elementary, challenging, and difficult thesis. And that is, we need globalism. We need globalism badly of social, moral, and political institutions. We should uh, think about moral globalism uh, right parallel uh, to the phrase which is today so often associated with economic globalism. That's going to be my thesis. Why we need it and how we may get there. Basically, what happened throughout uh, too much of our history that economic and technological forces, which we unleashed, which we prepared, which we funded, which we studied, and let loose, overpowering us, and we lost our ability to guide and direct them in line with our values through our political institutions. And, and the lack of our capacity to be on top, to guide rather than being overwhelmed, is growing ever more, we falling ever more behind as these technological economic hurricanes become ever fiercer, ever more rapid uh, in the way they swirl around us. That's all I which going to be talking about tonight. Now, to get there, I, I need to go back for a moment. Now, I do not agree with Marx that uh, in the early days, before modernization, before industrialization, the people had this happy life. He had that image of the, the artisan who, uh, unlike Adam Smith's person, who does a, a, a one job, a, a piece of a job, somebody else does a piece, and somebody else does a piece, and everybody's more efficient, but nobody gets to do the whole job, and then somebody comes and pieces it together. Marx had this wonderful image of the silversmith, so, a shoemaker who does the whole thing from A to Z and tremendously enjoy their work and f finds meaning in their product. Well, there may have been some such people in the Middle Ages or late Middle Ages, but uh, most of these people had a very short lifespan. Many of their children died young. They had no protection from disease. They were often exploited uh, and were in plain English miserable. So no, I'm not talking about going back to the happy artisan days or any one of those uh, happy savage uh, who saw kind of stories. But if we look what happened from that point on, is we first developed an enormous capacity to increase our muscles. Really, industrialization, if you put it all together, comes down to the fact that we can lift objects heavier, we can hurl them to the moon, uh, we, we can push around tons of steels, we can make uh, uh, giant reactors. We, we increased our muscle uh, to un our leverage, our power in that sense, to completely unprecedented levels. And then, more recently, so the development in communications and computers 
We kind of also extended our nervous system when we cannot send signals, as we all know, in seconds around the world. But what had kept no pace at all, has in, in no way paralleled this enormous expansion in, in power and capacity, is our capacity to decide which of these developments we find beneficial and which form deeply trouble our soul. We are not asked. There's no opportunities, there are no occasions. I'll come back to this again and again, where we can come together and say, this is in line with our traditions. That's in line with our preferences. And this must stop. We don't have that capacity. So what is lagging, if you wish to stay with the image, we have enormous muscles, we have enormous nerves, ner new nervous system, nerve systems, but our heart remains lagging and weak. Now, what happened here? In part, well, you see, I told I promise you I'm going to be halting. <laughs> Uh, uh, let me let me illustrate this uh, problem. So, uh, an area in which the developments already causing us considerable la loss of control, but we're just at the very beginning of the curve. Because what's going to happen next? So, to developments in biotechnology, make everything which preceded it from a moral and human challenge, look uh, like a preparation, like an introduction. Because we're going to take now all the issues we could take for granted till now. Uh, what our children look like, uh, what gender do they have, uh, how do they relate to each other, and we're going to all open that up again to some uh, new uh, technological developments. And we have to make decisions such as, are we going to allow a family to have an extra child in order to harvest the parts of that child for one of their sick children? Are we going to allow uh, people uh, to clone each other in, in their attempts to transfer to future uh, their own uh, existence? Uh, are we going to allow gene shopping? Are we going to allow people to go to a, a store and, or an order the profile uh, of their children, blonde, whatever, blue-eyed, uh, six foot twenty, or whatever. Uh, all these things which until recently were in the hands of nature are now going to come up again to human decision, individual and collective, and we do not have the instruments to make uh, those decisions. There's no way in the end, and that's really my point, if you or I, all of us in this room, all of us in this country, or all of us in this world will say, this we don't want, we do not have the instruments to stop or direct or deflect any of these developments. Uh, let me make this a little more concrete. Uh, many moons ago, uh, I had three wonderful sons, wonderful sons. By the way, they're not born wonderful, but they became wonderful. Uh, <laughs> And my wife and I wanted to have a girl. And so I went to the library that's, you know, relatively comfortable and started reading up on all the literature of what you can do uh, to have uh, a girl. Uh, by the way, if you want to know the, the ultimate illustration of loss of control, I had two more sons since then. <laughs> well. Uh, but I read an article, I mean, you know, you don't, you don't get the children you want, you can write an article about it. So I read an article about what would happen if uh, everybody in society could, as we very close to be able to do now, to choose the gender of their child. And uh, I found actually surprisingly strong data that at least in terms of the values which exist in those days, a me years back, there's going to be a very significant surplus of boys. Now, my economists, some of my economist friends will say, don't worry about it, uh, then the value of girls will rise, you know, 
and then after a while, the equilibrium is going to reassert itself. But you know, it takes 15 years before you notice that you know uh, there's a shortage of girls, uh, 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 and, and then you grow them. You know, and it it, it creates at least a certain amount of upheaval. Uh, if you have, uh, uh, and if you want to see an example, go to Alaska. And so, uh, we, the question concerned me, and so I, I did an article published in Science, which was called Sex, Science, and Society. And because it had sex in the title, not gender, this was before we knew to call it gender, every newspaper in the world copied the article uh, uh, and uh, reported my findings. And that resulted in me being invited to an international conference on bioethics in uh, 1970 of researchers who worked on new biological technologies. And they were talking about growing fetuses in the laboratories as part of in vitro fertilization experiments and what they're going to do with them. And when they turned out not to grow the way they wanted, they would flush them down the sink, let's say. And then they talked about experiments they were doing on children were born without immunological defenses, Garfield's host. And they start talking about uh, uh, cloning in those days. And I was just absolutely horrified. And uh, I wrote a book called Genetic Fix in which I summarized what I learned in those days. But the thing which drove home to me, that's where that starts staying with me. That there was no way on earth you could have stopped any of this. If our government will not allow, I'm not talking about if that's the right or the wrong thing to do. Maybe stem cell research is the perfect thing to do. Actually, I think it is. But it doesn't matter. That's what I want to say. It doesn't matter. If we would all say, like one person, we don't want it, then it would be done in Mexico or in Switzerland, or, or, or. And if you say, well, these other countries don't have the kind of money, it's enough for one billionaire to fund it, and there are plenty of them today, and that research will be done somewhere. We do not have the mechanisms for stopping technological, social, economic forces which we find dangerous. And for the last time, that the threat is accelerating as more and more innovations, especially in the biology area, are, are going to come online, and we haven't come to terms with the last ones. Until nuclear weapons came on, on the scene, we thought naively that science meant progress. But we, nuclear weapons were the first to call our attention to the fact that science technology can cut both ways, and we need to learn to come to term with that direction. And it cannot be done nationally. It cannot be done one country at a time. The only way we can come to terms is an extremely, let me be the first to say it, an extremely challenging proposition. If you would talk to me a few years back and said we need a world community, we need a world government, uh, I, I, I would have thought, you know, one of the United Federalists, you know, I mean, well-meaning souls, but, but there is no choice. There's no alternative. There's no way to do this country by country. Uh, the, the, the capacity to develop, to promote, to, is today all over the world. And if we don't do it in one place, we do it in the other. And the only way we can ever again or top again, if we make this extremely difficult leap, start moving toward finding institutions which would be as encompassing as the threats are, uh, as reaching as the technological and economic forces are, we need to deal with. Take up with this question of flight of capital. I just came back from a, a party, a meeting of the Labour Party in Brighton in England. And they are struggling with the question of why do we tax labor one way and capital another way? Uh, labor, we withhold taxes at the source, as we do, and therefore most people who have wages uh, have no choice but to pay more or less the taxes due. Those who get their payments uh, and interest and dividends 
we do not withhold the source. We tried once and got our finger burned. Uh, and uh, therefore, they're much more likely uh, in the end not to pay what's due. Now, there's a whole wonderful theoretical debate if we should tax dividends and interest in the first place. Uh, uh, that's uh, for another day. But it's clear that uh, from a social justice viewpoint, uh, labor carries a burden with those who have what's called unearned income do not. Well, you come to the Labor Party, it will not take you more than five minutes to convince them that why don't we do the same for t uh, dividends and interest? Why don't we hold the source? You know why? It is a short sentence. The banks can take the money and move it to another country. You can tax labor because it's not mobile in the end. People are not, not going to dump their communities, their country, because taxes have withheld the source. But the investment funds, they at a two second wire will disappear on you, and, and the flight of capital is just to mention it, and it's enough to close any conversation of, of trading capital the same way we treat labor. The only way that can happen, I, I, don't, I think on that point, some people may think we shouldn't do it, but I don't think there's much disagreement on the point. If you're going to do that, the only way it can be done, if it's done, maybe not for every little country in the world, but uh, OECD, J Japan, United States, and Europe, at least would have to come together. I'm not interested in the specifics of should we, should we not tax capital, or should we, should we not be sold. I'm trying one more time to illustrate the point that if you're going to try to do it country by country, we're just not going to get there. Now, there are those, and I suspect you heard some of them uh, early in the conference, which I'm very sorry to have had to miss because I, I did go to another country, uh, who will argue that we should throw up high national barriers, high local barriers to prevent global forces from buffeting us, from churning us, from imposing their uh, will on us. I, I don't think this is such a lunatic uh, way of thinking. Uh, I think uh, record shows that uh, within uh, limits, to some extent, that uh, can be done. It's not that the game is completely over, that nations no longer have any leverage just to give one example of that course, so it's not the main one I'm going to recommend. During the last financial crisis, quite a few countries were very seriously uh, uh, damaged and the economies were put uh, to kind of ringer, uh, Indonesia, uh, Latin America and such. But uh, Malaysia said, wait a moment, they put up uh, a high uh, tax on hot money and uh, they said, we're not going to allow that to, to happen to us. And some of my colleagues in economics said, well, that's the end of Malaysia. Uh, nobody's going to ever invest again in Malaysia because they know that they may get locked in there. Those of you who follow that story know two things happened. First of all, Malaysia did much better than other countries. And second, when they finally lifted the extra tax, uh, hot money flew in like there was no tomorrow. So uh, I'm, I'm just uh, trying to give this one example to say, I'm not saying because no nation or no group of individual nations can be the main carrier of what needs done, that there's nothing can be done locally or nationally. But clearly, clearly, from what I illustrated earlier, the, the forces uh, of economy and technology are so huge, so strong, that that is not the main basis on which we can get our values to control what we are doing and what's done to us. And the next level is that of building regional bodies. The most uh, obvious one is that uh, they attempt to create a European community. And the idea is when you take a large number of uh, countries, uh, especially uh, countries which are uh, affluent and developed, and you bind them together and you create a larger body the way we created the uh, United States, then you get a, a more heavier player somebody who can uh, better stand up to these uh, global uh, forces. And I think to the extent that you can do that, indeed you get some additional leverage. 
So let me point you to a detail which will be very, very important for all that follows. I'm sad to say, and I said that the book called Political, Political Unification 25 years ago, and I don't see any reason to change my mind. The European community, I'm sad to say, will fail. Precisely, precisely because it's trying to have economic unification without political unification. It again, it, it created a larger market, but it's and it beginning to create some true European institutions, a parliament and, and a, uh, a kind of an executive and courts and such. And there, there is some attempt, but the speed, the pace is such that you get much more rapid economic integration than you get political integration, and there is quite explicit resistance, or in fact, growing resistance on, on the next level, and you cannot stand between two steps. You cannot have half integration. That's the sad lesson here. I, I don't like it. I, I, I wish we could do with this partial arrangements, but if you study the European community, there's a lesson for all of us. And unfortunately, if you are going to create a, a, a kind of fabric of institutions, we can do the mission I, I think we need to give them. They cannot be done halfway. Here's the reason why. When you have joint economic policies across countries, these countries are in different state of development, and different state of need. Spain and Portugal and Ireland uh, and Finland are doing particularly well. Uh, Greece is uh, not doing so well and so on and so on. Some have recessions, some have high employment, some have overheating. If you're going to have a joint policy the way we have, we, we also have difference between the states, but we have one policy for all 50 states on these things, is because we have a commitment to our larger community as a nation, and we in effect saying, though not on those in these words, that some of us are willing to suffer for another part of the country because we are one nation, because we are one family. And so we don't say, you know what, uh, Mississippi uh, has these problems, but New York, let's do it for New York, but not for Mississippi. We have one federal reserve system, one treasury, one taxation system uh, on the federal level. In the European community, things go lovely as long as everybody benefits. But the moment one of the countries is out of step with the others for one reason or another, and it now needs in order to be treated cause significant pain to all the others, there is no that loyalty. There is no loyalty to Europe, which is strong enough to say, I'm willing to put up as a fairly hefty cost pain in, in order to accommodate my sisters and brothers in the other countries. Or to put it more technically, unless loyalty and commitment and identity will be transferred from the, to, in part from the nation state to these new larger regional bodies, they will not have the, the normative, the emotive, the political leverage they need to do what they need doing. Now, I want to be careful here. I'm not talking about wiping out the nation state. I'm not talking about replacing it with some kind of a global community. I'm going to introduce here uh, this one concept that sociologists make their living by making funny distinctions, and uh, I don't want to tax your patience, but I just need uh, one. I want to talk about layered loyalties. What we have in this country is we allow, we understand that people have more than one level of commitment. So I'm sure, uh, I don't know, but I assume there's some commitment to St. Peter. Maybe some people have feeling about Minnesota, about the, the nation. And that's about the way it is. So it's the fact that you are a good American doesn't mean you have to be a bad Minnesotan on disloyal to Minnesota. So we stagger, we split our loyalties. The most interesting example of this, and very important to understand the American genius, is something most countries have not learned yet to do, is what we call the hyphenated Americans. We have what I think more precisely should be called not diversity, not pluralism, but pluralism within unity. And since this is essential, 
uh, to all that follows, let me explain a little more what I mean by that. They uh, tell our fellow Americans it's perfectly fine for them to pray to whatever God they want to pray. We don't have a uniform church or requirement and the way, let's say, uh, Scandinavia used to have and Britain used to have. We allow people to be proud of the heritage they brought from their country of origin. We don't mind at all if they keep their the music and the dancing and the cuisine from their mother country. But we want them to accept that these are subcultures within a larger community. And so uh, if you go to one of those endless ethnic meetings, it doesn't matter if it's Polish Americans or Italian Americans, Swedish Americans, there are always two flags, one of the country of origin and one of the United States. And when they sing the songs, they have to be both of them. And if you ever go to one of these meetings, somebody will forget to bring the American flag. You're going to get an earful. Why? Because that symbolizes that, yes, we came from different places. We have different sub-loyalties. But it's part of the Chinese nestling boxes within a larger uh, loyalty, which allows us to maintain a larger family while we recognize also our uh, separateness. The debate we have sometimes is not about the basic concept that we have layered loyalties, that we have some commitments to smaller circles and some to larger. But the debate we have is on the boundary. What belongs in the larger box? what belongs uh, into the diversity. So for instance, uh, it's clear that the Bill of Rights applies to everybody. It, it's not for one community, it's not for Swedish Americans, it's a, a right all Americans have. And no community, no subgroup can deny its members the right to free speech, uh, the right to free assembly, so on down the line. We do not treat a democratic system as an alternative. You like authoritarianism, you like tyranny, you, you like theocracy, some of us like democracy. That, that's not negotiable. Or even the notion of mutual tolerance and respect is a core value we all share. And something we don't talk about enough, though we heard about it a lot in the last years, is we have what I think are correctly is called a constitutional faith. We, we, believe in the we believe firmly in the government of laws rather than of people. And when people try to put themselves above the law, uh, they hear plenty from us because that's something we all share. So th there's a clear layer of things we share. Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the government of laws, tolerance, probably the English language, so that's more controversial. And then there's a whole bunch of things we allow people to have sub uh, uh, loyalties. For the last time, uh, we have sometimes debate about the, the, the line which separates. For instance, one of the Native American churches use peyote, uh, a narcotic, for its religious uh, services. And so they said, look, that's part of our community. And another voice came from the national level and said, wait a moment, is the law of the land that you cannot use peyote? And there was this fight about who will win in this case, that our nationwide commitment or our local commitment. And after a complicated story, we allowed Native Americans to, to proceed. In other cases, we went the other way. When they tried to have polygamy in Utah, we said, I'm sorry. That goes beyond what we allow people to do. So we always have some tension about the marking line which separates the universals from the particulars. But we clearly, the basic underlying structure is this two-level uh, division. And what we need to do next, and the good news is what we're beginning to do next, is create more layers above them, not to replace local ones, not to replace nation ones, but to make them part of yet a larger, uh, larger uh, family. And that is precisely what is running to trouble now. Why? Because for 200 years or more, we have learned and other people have learned to invest their identity, their sense of self, of who they are, and many of the communal bonds in the state. What a nation really means is a combination 
of a sense of community married to a particular piece of territory and government. And what we need to do now, what we need to do now, is find ways to maintain our identity and to maintain our particularisms and to maintain our distinctions, distinctiveness, while we are allowing pieces of sovereignty and government and control to move to the next higher level. And that is what the Danes just objected to, uh, where they did not want to turn over, disappear, uh, in a, a kind of what they call Brussels, which is the symbol for the new uh, Europe-wide bureaucracy, because there was no sense that you could ma maintain your Danishness uh, while you allow some controls to be moved to the next level. Uh, on the way to Britain, I stopped in France. That's the number one deb debate in France. Should we allow ourselves in any way to turn over powers which belong to the nation to this larger entity, or as Girard insisted, we will, have, we will coordinate among nations, but we will not have a family of nations. That's the issue in Britain. Uh, the hottest issue in Britain is not are we going to join the EU or not. That's a highly technical debate. But the EU, the, the Brits understand correctly, stands for a much larger question. If you're going to join the EU, you will have to join a shared decision making. You'll have to transfer. This will not happen until we do just the opposite. We kind of unravel this combination which we were so proud of, that we married our identity to a particular piece of land and to a particular government, and uh, learned that you can be uh, um, French-American or whatever, uh, or a good Brit or good Scot, while still maintaining membership in, in larger and ever larger communities. And that is probably the most difficult question, and we did surprisingly little, how we can create institutions which allow people to maintain community without maintaining government. Here is an example of the issues in which this comes up. This comes up, for instance, around the issue of cultural exception. The Canadians say they are about to be lost. They're going to be treated, are treated, like a 51st, 51st, 51st state. What they would like to do is to limit the import of American movies, Time Magazine and such, and they want to subsidize their own movie, their own theaters, their own uh, magazines. That's what the French want to do uh, to protect their culture uh, within the international uh, trade world. And here is a wonderful, wonderful example I'm talking about. Here's a direct clash between global economic forces, for whom is a magazine is a magazine, and Turkey is a Turkey, and they all uh, need to abide by the same economic forces, we'll reduce the prices, we'll sell them. International treaties will not allow you to make cultural exceptions. Or we're going to say, wait a moment, that's a wonderful example. By exempting whatever, 2% or less of the total flow of products and services, those which allow people to maintain their cultural identity from all this internationalism, you make it easier for people to maintain their identity uh, and give up on uh, the notion that all the governmental controls have to be within the nation and not can, cannot move up to the next level. Now, I, I talked plenty about the challenge and how difficult it is and how reluctant and resistant people are to go where we need to go. And uh, I'll be the first to admit, uh, while I know the direction we have to go, I don't have a old map how to get there. But I want to suggest to you some hopeful signs, uh, some beginnings, first stars in the wind, that we are beginning to develop the, the, the foundations, the building blocks for what uh, is an extremely challenging dream, that of a world community. One of the things which happen, and people don't like to talk about it, and maybe it's just as well, English is becoming the world language. Uh, people get their back up, and we say that, and maybe we shouldn't say it often. 
But you know, when there's a meeting in the Balkans, uh, and the Hungarians and the Romanians and the uh, Russians and the Poles meet, what do you think they talk to each other? Most time they talk to each other English. When there's a meeting in Asia, or, or, or and the, the younger the people are, and the more into sciences, uh, it, English is the world's language. It's the language of the internet. If you want to fly an airplane, you have to learn English. Uh, this is the, the international language of airports. So the, this is not a small step. If you think about historically, what emotional, powerful fights we had over the question, what's going to be the language of this new territory? Is it going to be German or, or English or Hebrew or, or German or whatever? Like the culture comes. Or, all centered around this question of language. Well, without a lot of parades, we beginning, beginning to solve that problem. People want to keep talking Hindu and Swahili and all the other things. But in addition, most of them increasingly are going to have a shared language worldwide. English. We have, as of course you all know, instant communication worldwide, which allows us to share information, to organize people uh, within seconds. It's not only economic information which flows on the internet. Uh, it's uh, the people who protested uh, the uh, meetings in, in, in Prague and in Seattle, they're also using the internet. We have um, the beginning, the beginning of creation of additional Cross national bodies, not international bodies. We always had bodies where different nations came together and negotiated an arrangement, the League of Nations or something, or the radio frequency. But they, of course, were built on the assumption that the major powers were going to reside within each nation. And then they're going to make arrangements among them. That's what technically the word international means. But if you look at the, the international court uh, the, in Hague, you see something very different. Here are people from one country, went to another country, took some people, these people, who are not from that country, say they're criminals, grabbed them by the neck, and brought them to a third country to be tried by judges from a fourth country. Well, that's a, a lot of uh, cross-nationalism. And we're having a debate now about uh, which United States, unfortunately, is uh, not uh, uh, very supportive of, of creating an, uh, an international criminal court. So in the future, if there's going to be another Milosevic, long before he will commit uh, uh, another ethnic cleansing, we'll put him on notice and say, if you ever live your little, leave your little country, that's what's going to end up before an international criminal uh, court. There are many other such beginnings, maybe the one which is a little less kind of uh, coolish than uh, all those courts. Uh, Bob Cohen did a, a wonderful study of the community of people from different countries who are in charge of the environment. Uh, they're from all over the world. There are ministers, assistant ministers, uh, civil servants whose job is to care about the environment in their country. And they all know each other. They go, to, uh, go from meeting to meeting to conference, you know, and they're on email with each other. And they form the community. And now often they do things to slightly twist and slightly deflect what the government would like them to do because the, you know, all their best friends and all the people who they respect are all these other environmental civil servants from all the other countries. So we have the beginning of an international community, cross-national community, of people who care about the management of the environment who see each other not simply as representing their country but as also representing a large entity, uh, that of the whole globe. And then we come finally maybe to the most difficult challenge of them all. And that is, if you are going to have global institutions and arrangements, some governance will need to talk about shared uh, global values. And uh, that, uh, I've been taxing your patience, is uh, a particularly important topic to what is all that's going to, f we need to think about. So bear with me. I want to introduce here the notion of moral dialogues. 
Those of you who I know, some of you are in political science. Uh, in political science, people talk about uh, reasoned deliberation, so a de deliberative democracy, and that's this image of people coming together in a town meeting, and they're all very cool, cool and collected, and there's a problem the town face, so they're bringing facts and logic and reason things out, and they come to a new shared understanding where we ought to go from here, and that's what happened next. This is not what I'm talking about. I, I'm not denying that occasionally something like, like this happens, so I think it's surprisingly rare. Those of you who uh, saw Jane's Mansbridge study, she went to some of those, and they ain't as cool as I believe. And uh, uh, those of you who go to a meeting of scientists, I guess you just had some here, uh, they don't all uh, completely agree each other or use only cool, uh, logical, empirical uh, arguments, I think. But what happens really, and is of tremendous importance, is that communities engage in dialogues in which they bring their values to the table. They do not leave them at home the way Bruce Ackerman argued. They don't bracket them and say, well, at home I can be follow of this or follow of that, but in the public space I'm just a neutral. All I can talk about is traffic arrangements. What happens is that people learn to engage in your other about conversations, profound conversations, about what's right and wrong. Well, I think it, our first instinct is to say, well, I can see how that can happen now on a dinner table in a family, maybe in a small community, but, but how can you have a moral dialogue on a nationwide level, I'd not even talk about global. Well, let me tell you. Let me first start with an example. In the 1950s, the environment was not on our moral uh, map. It was not on our moral agenda. It, nobody thought about that we had any moral obligations to the environment. I mean, maybe some one professor wrote a paper about it. But as a community, it was not an issue. We dumped things into the air and into water without any uh, hesitation. And Rachel Carlson wrote a book, Silent Spring. By the way, these dialogues often start this way, with a book, a thesis. There was an oil spill and demonstrations, and in Santa Barbara, they buried a new car alive, and uh, a lot of drama. So the first step is a message. Then we get drama in which we engage our people. And there follows what I like to call a billion hour buzz. The people at the water cooler, in pubs, where they commute, in talk, calling shows, uh, uh, and over dinner table, talk to each other across all kind of lines. What, what are our obligations to the environment? And when you're in the middle of that process, it sounds unwieldy and, and confusing and meandering and disorderly. It has no beginning, it has no end. So, Kovac is here. Doesn't like what I have to say. When you're in the middle of this conversation, it looks like there's no beginning, no end, just a lot of screaming. If you come two and five years later, you see something very special. First of all, most times, we do form new shared moral understandings. New shared moral understandings. We did come out of that conversation with a sense that we have a moral commitment Mother Earth. We still argue at the margins. We still argue about loggers as against uh, spotted owls and such. But about the basic question, I don't know anybody who wants to go back to the 1950s. Conservative or liberal, uh, we, we all sh recognize that we have a profound new moral commitment, shared one. I mean, one of the interesting little uh, signs how deeply shared it is that we're, on the one hand, of course, we have this policy that we're not supposed to teach values in public schools. The liberals fear religious indoctrinization, and the right fears that children be taught liberal values. So at least officially, we're not supposed to teach values in schools with the very odd consequence that when we have sex education, we treat it as if it was a plumbing issue or not a question <laughs> of uh, social responsibility and personal responsibility. But when you come to the environment, those of you who have young children or, like me, grandchildren, 
they public schools have no hesitation. They drill into them uh, environmentalism uh, in, the, in the most uh, systematic and profound manner because this is now basically a shared value. Betty Friedan in 1963 wrote the famous book, The Feminine Mystique. And it started the women's movement and a fierce, complicated, painful debate about the relationship between men and women. It's not over. We didn't do all the changes. But it had very profound effects. We changed the way we treat each other. By the way, that's really a crucial point here. It's not that we simply change our opinion, our beliefs are very important. But we, we change the habits of our heart. We change the way we conduct ourselves. Environmentalism led people to conserve more, to ride bicycle more, use this funny paper. It, all kind of change in, in actually implementing the new moral commitment. And laws followed. Laws did not lead. They reflected the new shared understanding. The same happened in the relationship between men and women. People, married couples, people to be married, went to very complicated, painful dialogues, drawing on this nationwide conversation. And out of this came, by many standards, not sufficient change, but not insignificant change. The same, of course, holds for the civil rights movement. Let me give a, 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 a smaller example. During the Thomas Hill hearing about the allegation that Judge Thomas engaged in sexual harassment. At the beginning, uh, all the men I know, including a major, major newspaper, thought that there wasn't an issue. Right? It's kind of a, a joke, uh, sexual harassment. You know, women talked about the men. No, there was no such thing. We had a two-week se national seminar on sexual harassment. A lot, a lot of conversation, a lot of, lot of boardrooms and corridors and such. And I think by now most men know that when women complain about sexual harassment, they have plenty to complain about. And we change the way we conduct ourselves. We change our laws and our policies. It's not very far from perfect. Now, one, this is not just the past. At the moment, we have at least two difficult moral dialogues. One about the death penalty and the other about gay marriages. Uh, it, it doesn't matter to me now which side on this you take or I take. All I'm saying is watch these conversations. At the moment, it just looked like everybody's staring at everybody and everybody's pulling in a different direction. Watch them two years, five years. In effect, you already see very significant changes in our heart, in the way we conduct ourselves uh, in our institutions. As we get closer here to the close, what we need to do now, what we are doing now, is having moral conversations, as fancy as that may seem, on the global level. We are talking to each other now across nations, not through governments, people to people, about landmines. We get, people get together to fight landmines. There's a new shared understanding that we should do without them. We have a global environmental movement which found its expression in Rio, which the United States uh, was very uncomfortable with. It was uncomfortable because there's a worldwide outcry that we need to protect the environment better. We have a difficult, complicated conversation which moves forward about veils and about ivory about sex slaves, about exploitation of children. So we, we succeeding in taking the same processes which serves us so well in our local communities and our nation, and we lift them to the next level to create the kind of shared values which will need to guide us if we are going to have the beginning of a global community without which none of the issues are listed uh, will be uh, controllable. Uh, to bring this to a close, uh, uh, allow me to tell you uh, one brief story from the Jewish scriptures from the Talmud. It's a story about uh, two students of a rabbi who were arguing when the night is over 
and the day begins. And one of the students said, if you look over there and you see a tree, and you can tell if it's a fig tree or an olive tree, then you know that the night is over and the day began. The other student said, no, 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 that's not the way it works. If you look over there and you see a little animal and you can tell if it's a goat or a calf, then you know that the night is over and the day begun. So they went to the rabbi and said, Rabbi, what say you? The rabbi said, no, no, that's not the way it is. If you look over there and you see a woman and you can tell if she's black or white and you call her my sister and if you go look over there and you see a man and you can tell if he's an Israeli or a Palestinian and you call him my brother then the rabbi said the day a new day begun thank you Dr. Rezioni will take a couple of questions, and I think I'll do it if, uh, if somebody raises their hand, whoever's first. I uh, promise my answers be less than one hour and 45 minutes. Do <laughs> <laughs> we have any questions? Oh, we have a microphone, even. Great. Technology does terrible Hello. things first. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Twyla Braze. I'm from Citizens Council on Healthcare, and I've read some of your things about privacy. But I really, um, and I wanted to say that I appreciate the moral dilemma that you're talking about and what's growing. I have two concerns. One has to do with um, what comes out from consensus building, I believe, with the World Health Organization that says that the United States is 37th best in the world. And when you look at the report, it says it's because we don't have explicit rationing policies. The second is that a friend of mine was asked by a federal committee to be on the commission, except she had to go through a questionnaire. And when it was all done, they said, I'm sorry, but we want to build consensus, and you won't work. And so you see my concern when you have these global communities is who's going to be on them, and will it really be the consensus of the people or will it be the consensus of those who call the meeting together? Thank you. Well, it is an excellent, 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 excellent question. And I'm tempted to go back on my promise, <laughs> not to make the answer less than, let me, allow me to make it briefly. Uh, I didn't use the word consensus. I, I said there arise new shared moral formulations. The technical reason is because I believe they don't come simply from consensus, they come that there are certain profound moral values in us. And the conversation allowed them to bubble up to the surface and scrape away cultural and historical residues which hide them because otherwise we would not need the moral dialogues. If you want to be even more technical, I'm talking about a deontological approach that there are certain things, certain moral causes which speak to us in unmistakable uh, voices. But it doesn't take away your question. When we have a moral dialogue in our country, in a, in a local community, in a family, there's no guarantee it's going to come out the way I want it, or in line with my values. So my family can decide, you know, that they want whatever. Uh, and uh, I, I may go along uh, because in the end, uh, I feel committed to the family but it will not always come out the way I wanted it. Uh, otherwise, I will be deterrent. Uh, if you have a conversation in St. Peter's, I don't think it will always come out 
to where any of us would want it, but that is the nature of building communities, that we, uh, in effect, take each other into account. Now, it does not always work. On some issues, at the end of the day, we are still conflicted. Uh, and that then, in effect, caused a lot of grief, as our debate about abortion is. But uh, very often, uh, when there is a genuine conversation which requires it to be open, uh, do new shared understanding do bubble up, and, and most people find them sufficiently compelling that they change their own conduct in line with these new uh, shared understandings. They're not a guarantee. It's just the best days. I figured I could talk loud enough for everybody to hear me. Um, Houston Smith, in his fairly recent um, uh, reissue, I guess I would say, of his 1950s classic, The World Religions, in his epilogue made a comment that um, sounds fairly consistent with what you're saying. Um, I, I'm interested in your comment on it. He um, said that the 20th century, he feels, will not be noted for the atom bomb, the automobile, electricity, et cetera, so much as it will be noted for one thing in the, in the long-term future, and that is that it was the first century in history where everybody in the world had to take everybody else seriously. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Well, I think it's extremely well put, uh, uh, and that's really my point. We, we have no choice. Uh, that's our best guide, that if we are in any way to tackle these accelerating threats, we'll have to take everybody uh, seriously, which is a hell of a challenge. I do not want to minimize it. We have difficulties in reaching consensus within an affluent society of 260 million people, or shared understanding, sorry, I slipped. Uh, and so if you want to talk about six billions, and at the moment much larger diversity, it's a challenge of several orders of magnitude higher. By the way, therefore, I would not think we should throw everything into that basket things we can keep locally or nationally, we definitely should. But we'll have to learn that on some key issues, we are learning, they'll have to be done on the highest level. <laughs>